Peace be with you. My name is Mike Solberg. I'm one of the pastors here at the Union Church of Hinsdale. It is a delight to be in worship with you this morning. I, of course, am preaching today from here in the sanctuary, a place that I know many of us miss, and we certainly miss being together here. But we are still worshiping God together, and that in and of itself is a beautiful thing. Let us pray. Most gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that it's easy to get distracted these days. And that's true across the board, from the individual level to the national level. On the individual level, I read recently that for people who are working at home because of the coronavirus and who have children at home, they get interrupted on average every 3 minutes and 27 seconds. And unless you are really disciplined about your work habits, email, text, internet news, YouTube, and 538.com are constantly lurking. They are ready to pounce and disrupt any decent train of thought that you have going. On the national level, some of President Trump's co-workers have confirmed that Mr. Trump intentionally uses distraction to control the news cycle. If something unflattering to him is being talked about in the news, he will tweet out about some shiny object that he knows people will react to precisely to get them to stop talking about the unflattering thing. And our media, both liberal and conservative, seem to fall for it every time. It is such a pattern that when Mr. Trump announced early on Friday that he had tested positive for the coronavirus, many people assumed that he was just trying to distract the conversation away from his poor performance in the debate on Tuesday night. Yeah, distractions are everywhere these days, and it's hard to focus on what really matters. One of the common themes these days in my conversations with other pastors is how not to fall victim to all of the distractions out there. A few weeks ago, many of you really appreciated it when I said that it can be important to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And there is, of course, some sense in which that is true, but it's also a danger, right? Even if a preacher doesn't miss the the forest for the trees, there is still the danger of the forest making you miss the divine mystery and the beauty and the life that is out there to be seen. Some of you know that I resist the idea that I should stay away from politics in my preaching, but I admit that if I preach about political things, that is, things that matter to the broader life of our community, if I do that in a way that's unconnected to the gospel, then I surely should stop. The gospel is what ultimately matters. The fact that God recreates us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is what matters. I pray, literally pray, that God will guide me and give me courage to preach about what really matters. Our passage today has a lot that could distract us. In absentee landlord, evil tenants, fatherly negligence and stupidity, greed, vengeance, and at least eight battered and bloodied bodies strewn across the 11 verses of this passage. 
As if all of that weren't enough of a distraction, it's clear that the story is an allegory about Jesus himself, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, our ruler, guide, and friend, who is himself soon to be betrayed and abandoned by his friends and tortured and executed by his enemies. All because God's love is apparently too big a threat to be given free reign in this world. But I still think all of that is a distraction. There's something else that we should focus on in this passage, not human, but alive, barely noticed, but vital, silent and still, but active. The vineyard itself is the thing to focus on here. The parable begins with the vineyard being planted by God, created, a new thing that has come into the world. The vineyard is given all that it needs to be full of life and to be fruitful. Many of you have probably visited vineyards, probably ones intentionally set up as tourist destinations. What is true in such modern, comfortable situations was even more true in ancient vineyards, and that is that a vineyard is not a manufacturing plant. It's a living, breathing, growing, unpredictable, organic thing. To make it fruitful, you can't force it but rather you have to cooperate with it. You have to respect the living things, the plants themselves, uh, the worms, the bugs of all kinds, and the non-living things, the sun, the wind, the water, the soil, all of which are quite literally gifts from God. There are about a million things in a vineyard that you cannot control and about a few things that you can, like pruning and harvesting and fertilizing. To tend a vineyard is an act of cooperation, not control. We're talking about cultivation, not manufacturing. Vineyards deserve to be cared for and respected. If you treat a vineyard like a factory, it's not going to produce much fruit. And vineyards exist, of course, to produce fruit. The vineyard in our parable today, though, isn't producing much fruit. The people tending the vineyard are called tenants in the translation that we read. But the Greek word really is literally soil workers. These guys are supposed to be taking care of the vineyard, but instead of taking care, all they want is to take possession, ownership, control. And this drives them to possess rather than cultivate, and it leads them to homicide. At least eight first-degree murders by their hands. It's interesting, though, because right through to the end of the parable, what seems to really matter to the owner of the vineyards is not so much the murders that the, that the soil workers have done, committed, but the fact that the vineyard is not producing fruit. The murders only seem significant because they reveal the corruption of the farmers who were supposed to be working with the vineyard in order to produce grapes not seeking to own and control it. As the story is told, the great tragedy is here, not murder, but a vineyard that produces no fruit. This is probably a good time to give you some additional background on the passage, background you need to understand this parable. The story Jesus tells here is directly based on themes and images that are drawn from the book of the prophet Isaiah, writing at a time when God's people were, let me just say for now, way off track, way, way off track. Isaiah told a story 
calling God my beloved, Isaiah said. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And then, switching to the direct voice of God, Isaiah continues, Now, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its edge. I will it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the, crowd, the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. And then back to the voice of Isaiah again. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected fair judgments, but saw bloodshed. He expected justice, but heard a cry. The vineyard is the people of God, and the vineyard is producing its intended fruit. That is, not producing its intended fruit. The passage says, He expected fair judgments, but saw bloodshed. He expected justice, but heard a cry. The passage then in Isaiah goes on to describe our time, I mean his time, in greater detail. The gifts that God has given for the benefit of all the people, the land, the wealth, have themselves been taken over by the wealthy. Those who hoard all the wealth enjoy the peaceful, pleasant lives that surround them while others struggle to get by. This fifth chapter of Isaiah is about as clear and direct a description of income inequality as you ever see in Scripture. And remember, the reason that I'm telling you about this is because this passage from Isaiah is what Jesus sets before us in his story about the fruitless vineyard, the tenant workers and the murderers. Jesus uses the shorthand of the murderers to highlight all the injustices described by the Isaiah passage. But I don't want you to take this sermon but I don't want to take this sermon where you think or might fear or hope that it will go at this point. Yes, the United States has problems. Yes, we have systemic racism and inequality and a legal system that favors the white and wealthy and a health system that does the same. When it comes to national priorities, we are ignoring climate change, the power of money in politics, and the reality of the wage gap between men and women, and so many other things. And that's all important, but in a sense, it's also all a distraction. Shiny objects for me as a preacher to chase after rather than speaking of what matters most. The fact that God recreates us and the world through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Unless I start there, unless we start there, nothing else really makes sense. You see, I believe that God is at work in your life. If you have troubles, and who doesn't have troubles? God is, right now, at work in you. 
God is not the cause of your trouble, but God is able to take it in her hands and shape it and mold it and transform it into something that you can get through, something you can even grow through. God doesn't do away with darkness, but God does shine a light in the midst of the darkness and draws us to come toward that light. God is at work in your life right now in the midst of trouble. Look for the light and move toward it. That's how comfort happens That's how transformation happens. But there are other ways, too. Because sometimes our troubles are not things such as grief or anxiety or directionlessness or guilt, but rather an unsettled heart. A disturbance in the force, you might say. Sometimes, even when everything seems good, God is stirring. God is in your life churning. I beg you, don't be afraid of this work of God in your life. Let the full feeling of the stirring, churning grow in you. Even if it feels like something is being pruned away, Don't be afraid of it. That's God caring for your soul. That's how something new is born. That's how transformation happens. You see, what we are doing here is focusing on the vineyard, focusing on what the vineyard needs to thrive. Thrive why? Thrive so that it produces good fruit. For that is the purpose of the vineyard. As beautiful and beloved as a vineyard is in its own right, it has not lived into the fullness of its being until it is producing good fruit. And the vineyard is us. We, as individual vines, and together as a vineyard that we call church, We have not lived into the fullness of our being until we have been transformed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, until we are producing good fruit. It is the ultimate reason that God is at work in our lives. Now, having focused on what really matters, we can better see what God is really doing. God is comforting, forgiving, loving, treasuring, as well as stirring, churning, and pruning for the sake of the fruit. And the fruit is the same as it was 2,600 years ago when Isaiah first spoke of the vineyard, and the same as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus renewed the story the fruit that God is looking for, the fruit that God has been looking for for 2,600 years is fair judgments and justice, the sharing of power that results in the spreading out of wealth, the love of neighbor and the enemy that results in everyone having enough. It's all right there in a 2,600-year-old story. You hear that? 2,600 years. If being conservative means that you want to go back to the good old days and keep things from changing, then this story of the vineyard should make you very happy. If being conservative means that you want to defend God's values and give individuals the opportunity to thrive, then This story of the vineyard is for you. This is a conservative vision. And when he renewed this story 2,000 years ago, Jesus showed himself to be a true conservative. 
Now, it took the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to make it real. But as of 2,000 years ago, wherever Jesus is, that vision is real. Wherever Jesus is, his vineyard, his church, is comforted, loved, churned, and pruned. Wherever Jesus is, his church becomes gloriously fruitful, producing the love that creates true justice. I offer these words in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.